Tulsi Gabbard is an American politician who has had over 16 years of public work experience. She currently serves as Major in Army National Guard and has been deployed twice in the Middle East. Tulsi has been elected to Congress four times with over 70% of the vote. She graduated from Hawaii Pacific University in 2009 with a Bachelor Degree of Science and Business Administration. She's the first female combat veteran to run for president and one of the first in Congress. Gabbard officially launched her 2020 presidential campaign in February of 2019 and was the most Google candidate after the first, second, and fourth Democratic debate. Her domestic policy is economically as well as socially progressive, progressive, and she opposes military intervention in foreign affairs. She is running to bring a soldier's heart to the White House. It's great that she took the time to come to CHS, and with that, here is 2020 presidential candidate Tulsi Gabbard. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Did I hear some Neil 2020 calls out here? Yeah? yeah? <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Aloha. Aloha. How many of you have been to Hawaii before? A few of you. How many of you want to go to Hawaii? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> this is, um, I was born in American Samoa and raised in Hawaii, and I'm the fourth of five kids. So um, I didn't grow up not only experiencing winter, but I didn't grow up experiencing the four seasons as we have here campaigning across New Hampshire for the last year. For us in Hawaii, it's basically uh, sunny or rainy, and our trees are either green or brown. I didn't understand really what fall was until we came here. It was pretty amazing. We've really enjoyed being able to um, have the opportunity to spend this time here over the last year. And now we're 11 days out from election day. Um, I'll give you a little bit more background about myself and then talk about the number one thing that comes up in our town halls every day here. Uh, I have three older brothers and a younger sister and People don't believe me when I tell them this, but of the five kids in our family, I was definitely the least likely to do anything involved with politics. I was incredibly shy and a total introvert. Uh, my younger sister, I used to make her just be my spokesperson. I was totally fine with that. I was very happy to read, I was surfing, I did martial arts, I did all this stuff. I was fine hanging out with my friends. But I made my sister go and talk to people if anyone needed to be talked to. Uh, for me, what caused me to kind of step outside of my shell and my comfort zone in Hawaii was my interest and concern for environmental issues. Uh, it was um, something that I didn't have to be taught or told was important. It was a matter of when I went to the beach with my friends on the weekend, seeing a bunch of trash on the beach, that was something that kind of made me angry. And so we went and we started cleaning up the beaches on the weekends, but then started to see, okay, well, this isn't really actually helping deal with the root cause of the problem because every time we came back, there was more to clean up. So it was good, but it just wasn't quite enough. Uh, so I was um, 16 or 17 years old. I formed a nonprofit called Healthy Hawaii Coalition. And the goal of this nonprofit was about clean water, keeping our oceans clean. And um, we took a, we, we created a two day uh, session for elementary school kids and took this program across the state. I had a little help with writing a grant, but I, I wrote a skit called The Adventures of Water Woman. And it was a day in the life of Water Woman and Oily Al. I played the original Water Woman in this skit. And uh, we went through kind of the things that a lot of people might think or recognize in their everyday lives. You know, uh, Oily Al was changing the water, the oil in his car and about to dump the oil down into a storm drain. Water Woman came in and stopped him just in the nick of time and told him why this was not a good idea and where the water in the storm drain eventually drains out to. And for me, it was really incredible to experience that um, being able to see kind of the light bulb go off in these kids' eyes, second, third, fourth graders, who are kind of connecting the dots between the actions that we take every single day to how that was either positively or negatively impacting our home and our environment. And that experience had a huge impact on me. And it made me realize that 
somehow, some way, I wanted to continue to try to be in a position where I could make a positive impact on those around me, where I could best be of service um, to others. Uh, this is what eventually led me to uh, running for the State House of Representatives in Hawaii. I was 21 years old. A lot of people said, you're too young, you don't have enough experience. Uh, maybe you should go live your life a little bit before you go and try to serve your community. But even at that age, I understood that it wasn't about kind of the things on the paper that created the value of what any one of us could contribute to our community. It was really about that motivation and that commitment to serve. And it was an incredible experience to be able to earn that trust of my constituents, to be able to be their voice in our State House of Representatives. Breaking down the normal barriers that exist and just say, hey, we've gotta to come together to solve the problems that we face in our, co our, our community. And that's a very similar thing theme to many of the conversations that we're having um, in our town halls every day across New Hampshire. We have Democrats, Republicans, independents, and libertarians, people from all across the political spectrum coming together and saying, hey, we may agree or disagree on maybe a few issues, maybe many issues, but we stand together as Americans, treating each other with respect, we love our country and we care very much for our future. We care very much for our family, our loved ones, our community, our friends. And we recognize how dangerous of a path our country is on, given how divided we are. Given how in Washington, as well as in many of our communities across the country, so much of today's culture revolves around uh, an us versus them mentality where either I'm right, you're wrong, I'm good, you're evil, I'm part of this tribe, you're part of that tribe, and losing that sense of identity that we all have as Americans, which is necessary for us to be able to move forward as a country towards that more perfect union that our founders envisioned for us. And this is what gives me hope. This is what gives me hope even as there's increasing cynicism about how we can overcome these divides as a country because even with all of the differences that we may have, the unique perspectives we bring, we stand united on common ground upon that bedrock of our constitution that creates this unity for us as a country. It's really our choice. The choice is ours to be able to recognize it and to bridge those divides. To listen to the warning that Abraham Lincoln gave to us over 161 years ago when he said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. That is exactly what we're facing today and that's what we have to overcome. Uh, this is something that I had to directly kind of solve and figure out when I was first elected to Congress back in 2012. I uh, sworn in early 2013, uh, freshman Democrat coming into a strong Republican majority in Congress and being told right away, you're not going to be able to pass legislation because you're a Democrat and Republicans are in charge and they just won't let it happen. I didn't like that advice very much. Uh, because that's not why I ran for Congress. I, I ran for Congress to actually do things, to solve problems for my constituents. And so I had to figure out how was I gonna bridge that divide? How was I gonna make friends with my colleagues, whether they're Republicans or Democrats, from whatever part of the country uh, they came from? So I, I thought of a very basic thing that you might be able to relate to, the most powerful universal language of food to break through those barriers. My mother makes the most incredible macadamia nut toffee. And I called her up from DC and I asked her if she would make 434 boxes of toffee for every single one of my new colleagues. Break open those doors and at least let's connect around food. Uh, as she was in Hawaii doing that, I started to handwrite personal notes to every one of my colleagues. 
introducing myself and, and closing every one of these, just saying I look forward to serving with you. That no matter our differences, every one of us was sent there to be of service. We started to deliver these little gifts of aloha, as I call them, and it was incredible to see how quickly I got a response that uh, powerful leaders of different committees, people from other parts of the country, people who normally might not have given me the time of day, started to find me on the House floor during votes, uh, which is the only time all members of Congress are in the shared space together, and finding me and just saying thank you. Many of them uh, saying in a little bit of a hushed tone, hey, I ate all the candy myself. I need more to take home to my family this weekend. Can you hook me up? And then most importantly saying, hey, tell me what you want to work on in Congress. Tell me about the issues that your community is most concerned about. Let's work together. Plain and simple, let's work together. And it's because of those relationships that I was able to establish from the very beginning, based on respect, no preconditions, no, hey, I'm only going to go and hang out with my team because they're Democrats and you're Republicans, uh, no purity tests, just saying let's work together, let's serve together. I was able to pass legislation in my first year in Congress, able to get my phone calls returned when I'm trying to get votes for my bills that were going to the House floor. Being able to build those relationships that cross party lines that are based on this common commitment that all of our leaders must have to put country first, to put people ahead of partisan politics, put people ahead of profits, to put the well-being and the interests of the people of our country first. So this is the spirit that I'll bring to the presidency to the White House to bring about this vision where we as Americans standing and working side by side can bridge these divides and make sure our government is truly of, by, and for the people. Of, by, and for the people. Unfortunately, this is not what we have. This is not what we've had for a very long time. But now is the time that we have to make this change. Otherwise, we will never see real solutions to the perpetual challenges and problems that we face. Thank you very much for letting me come and talk to you here today. I look forward to hearing what's on your mind. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, I think we've got a couple of microphones here. I think, tell me if I'm wrong if, oh, here we go. Becky and Jeremy are coming to the rescue. Thank you very much. All right, here we go. So guys, if you want to, if you have a question that you'd like to ask, um, Tulsi, if you want to come down to the microphones, we'll start two lines. Probably have about time for about 30 minutes worth of questions. So if you have one, feel free to come on up. Don't be shy. Love you back. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. All right. We're, we're going to kick off the Q&A here. What's your name? Is your second question related to this or My different? Second question is not related okay, to this. I'll be quick in answering this so we can get to everyone's questions. Um, I have been outspoken against the ongoing occupation. And just last night in our town hall in Portsmouth, uh, the topic of this so called peace agreement came, came up from someone who thought it was a really good thing. And it was a strong step forward. And what I asked him was, do you think that if you're making an agreement between two parties that you actually need to have both parties participate in the process? And he said, yes, of course. But that's not what's happened with the agreement that was announced uh, by President Trump with Bibi Netanyahu uh, representing Israel the other day. And I think 
uh, even before you delve into the details of that agreement that was announced, which really does represent a, ver a, a biased path forward, if you could even call it that, uh, it's hard to take this seriously as a good faith effort towards a peaceful negotiation leading to a two-state solution, which I do support, when one party has been completely excluded from the process. So this gentleman asked me a follow-up. He said, well, they haven't really been excluded. They've been invited to come and join the, the conversation about this for years. But what I responded to him was, when the decisions that this administration has taken over and over again clearly and blatantly only benefit the Israeli interests while completely ignoring the Palestinian interests, there's really no, uh, there's no reason for them to believe that they will have a voice or a fair shot in this negotiation. So for me as president, I would try to lead with um, basically being that neutral arbiter to be able to try to bring both parties back to the table, make sure our policies are best uh, supporting getting peace talks back on track. Great, thank you. Um, and then my second question, it's um, kind of different, but um, so in America, we view voting as the most fundamental right um, that citizens have. Um, so right now, 48 states um, do not allow incarcerated people to vote um, via absentee ballots. This disproportionately disenfranchises black and Latinx Americans um, as a disproportionate number of black and uh, Latinx Americans are incarcerated. Um, these prison prisoner disenfranchisement laws are directly tied to Jim Crow laws that were designed to disenfranchise voters of color. Um, so Maine and Vermont already allow incarcerated um, citizens to vote via absentee ballot. Um, and for the most part, people from these states agree that it has been a positive measure. Um, so I want to know um, if you would support um, uh, allowing incarcerated people to vote via absentee ballots, restoring the right to vote. Um, this is an interesting question. You know, I, I have looked at this a little bit before and have expressed some concerns around this primarily because you're dealing with people who, not dealing with people, you have individuals who are living in a highly controlled environment and who could in that controlled environment be susceptible to bullying or pressuring to vote one way or another and not have the freedom and the privacy that we all have when we go and cast our vote in the ballot box. So that's my primary concern around, around that. I haven't looked and see, uh, to see uh, what the details are. You said it's Vermont and Maine? Yes. How they protect against that, and that's something that I, I would absolutely look into. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, I think nationally, we have to bring about the reforms to allow those who are convicted felons once they've served their time to get their right to vote uh, once they're released from prison. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Graham. Hi, Graham. And so this is something that's hit me really personally. I'm just gonna give you a little background info before I ask. And this is something I've asked a couple of other candidates before. Um, so it's almost five years ago now that my mom passed away from a terminal brain tumor. And I'm sorry. Take your time. And she made more money than my dad. And when she stopped working, half, half her income was lost. My dad couldn't take time off to spend time with me and his dying wife. <laughs> So my, my aunt and my grandma had to fly in from Michigan just to look after me, after me and my mom. So what I was wondering is, would you support the federalization of paid family medical leave so no other family has to go through what I went through? Thank you, Graham. Thank you. Can I give you a hug? Thank you, Graham, for sharing your own family's challenge and experience as painful as it is because you know that there are many, many other people across the country who have gone through exactly 
what you have struggled through, uh, which is why I fully support and am a co-sponsor of legislation in Congress for national paid family leave to make it so that no family has to make this kind of decision about complete financial insecurity and ruin versus being able to spend time with a loved one during the most critical and urgent need. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Bertie. And uh, I was wondering um, what you would do about um, the gun violence in schools across our country. Thank you, Brady. Brady? Yes. All right. Thank you for your question. Uh, there's a couple of things that I've already done as a member of Congress, but I think there's a, a broader approach that we as a country need to take to this ongoing um, clash uh, around gun violence. Uh, my staff and I, we were starting to have conversations to try to answer the question that you're asking. And as we were doing so, we found that there's been no collection of information from each of the schools where unfortunately mass shootings have already taken place to try to determine if there are any trends, are there any similarities, are there any things that, that uh, are coming to the forefront that can better help to prevent things like this happening our, in our schools in the future. So I, co I introduced legislation co-sponsored by a colleague of mine who lost her child because of gun violence at a school shooting to be able to begin uh, to collect this information so that leaders in Washington can make better informed decisions about what you know, uh, indicators may be popping up that educators and administrators should know of, uh, what programs we can put in place to better deal with some of the gaps that may exist you know, some of the things that have come to the forefront already is just the shortage in funding for things like school counselors, mental health professionals on campus to help provide care where care is needed. But there's more. This is only one piece of, uh, and, and one step to help us get to that place where we can prevent more of these tragedies from occurring. But I think as we do this, and I was really hoping that this bill would be a bipartisan bill. I had expressed uh, to some of my, uh, my colleagues why we were doing this. They understand why it's important. But unfortunately, uh, no Republican has signed on to the bill. And I think it's not, because, it's not because Republicans don't care about school shootings. I don't believe that for a second. It's, it's this highly partisan um, and polarizing culture that if you even mention anything related to guns, it's immediately well, you're walking down a slippery slope that will ultimately result in the government coming into your home and taking your guns from you, which is an extreme view and, and I think is not reflective, the reality of most people. Um, and I think on the other end of the spectrum, you have some people, well, you have some people who are advocating for that, to be quite frank. They're not in the, the majority, but you have a few people who say we should get, a, get rid of the Second Amendment altogether. It, it's a disservice to our country that we are in this polarizing environment because I've experienced it myself where most people, including strong Second Amendment advocates, including families who are terrified, mothers terrified of their kids getting shot in school, sharing that same objective of both upholding our constitutional rights and our Second Amendment, while also being able to have the peace of mind that when you go to school every day, you'll be able to come home at the end of the day, that you're able to focus on your studies, hanging out with your friends, doing what you do, and not having to have this fear lingering in the back of your mind. There are a number of things I think we've got to look at as a country to be able to address this. Some may be able to be addressed through legislation. Others uh, may not be, but we cannot we cannot make progress towards achieving those goals so long as we have this polar polarization and people parked in different camps and not having the tough discussion about their fears and concerns and their perspectives that others may not really understand. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, I was just wondering what your reasoning was for voting present on the Trump impeachment. Washington, as I mentioned, is, is 
unfortunately under this cloud of hyper-partisanship. Um, I was in South Carolina a couple of weeks ago talking to high school students, juniors and seniors uh, at their school, and I asked them a question, and I'll ask you the same question. How many of you are uncertain about the outcome of this impeachment? How many of you don't know how it's going to turn out? Hmm. Maybe a third, a quarter? I asked this same question of a different group of students, and not a single one of them raised their hands. That, and, and this is what I've experienced, is that most people, regardless of which side you're on, already had their minds made up before this whole process began. And my concern all along is that an impeachment process that is driven by partisan, bar partisanship on both sides is one that will only further divide an already divided country. So my vote in present, voting present, was to take a stand for the center, uh, choosing not to participate in this us versus them situation, and also recognizing that Trump is not innocent of wrongdoing and therefore introduced a censure resolution that included many of the other things that the impeachment articles did not include, where Trump has violated our Constitution and so forth, and uh, brought forth a message that it'll be the voters who will decide to remove Trump from office in November of 2020. I'm confident in my ability to be able to beat him, to remove him from office, and to get our country back on track. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, uh, so my question is, do you still support the maintenance of the Electoral College? And if so, why? I do support maintaining the Electoral College. However, it needs to be reformed. The reason why I don't support completely removing the Electoral College is because, like all of you, I come from a small state with a population of about 1.4 million people. And if we do, we have to go back to understand why the Electoral College was put in place in the beginning. And I think the intentions were correct where without the Electoral College, what you would likely see is presidential candidates and campaigns catering to and only going and campaigning to spending time with people in the most populated states in the nation, doing the math and say, if I win California and New York and Texas and Florida and Pennsylvania, then I can win this election. That the smaller, less populated states won't really factor in to their decision making at all, and I think that's a problem. I think that we as a nation need to be able to decide who our leaders will be. Here's the problem with the, the way the Electoral College uh, is not working for us now, is, is it is a winner-take-all system. So if, if I were to go and win California with 51% of the votes in November, uh, I get every single electoral vote from the state. This is how we end up with a situation where the Electoral College can beat out the popular vote. I think we need to change it so that it is representative and proportional. If I were to win 51% of California, I would get 51% of California's electoral votes. The beauty around this change is that unlike those who are advocating for getting rid of it, which requires a constitutional amendment, which is very, very hard to do, um, I don't know how many of you know, Virginia just became the latest state, for example, to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment, including women, into the Constitution. That has taken decades, decades. So changing the Electoral College to one that is proportional does not require a constitutional amendment. It just requires, I believe it's two-thirds of states to pass their own resolution saying, we want to make sure the Electoral College is proportional and then that change will be put in place, and I think about half of states have already done so. So this is a change that I think could and should happen as quickly as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi. What's um, your name? My name's Adam. Nice to meet you. Um, I had a, um, a member of my family that passed away in 2016. It, it, 
His name was Armand St. Jean, and uh, he was a husband to my, um, my grandmother. He passed away of uh, lung cancer. Um, my, my question is, um, how much trash has been in, like, Hawaii when you lived there? Well, I'm, I'm sorry to hear about the loss in your family. Thank you. You okay? Mm -hmm. Did he give that to you? No, my, 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 my mom did. Okay. To re remember me of him. Yeah. I'm sorry to hear that. Thank you. Um, I, f I, I don't feel comfortable talking about trash in Hawaii. We're talking no. about the loss of someone in your family. No. I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> um, I, I hope that he was able to get the care that he needed um, before, before he passed away. One of my very good friends who I deployed with uh, to Iraq, who I also served in the state house with, um, who I also served in Congress with. Uh, he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer uh, during his term in Congress. And even as the doctor said the outlook was very good, unfortunately that cancer very quickly took over and, and he left us before any of us were ready to say uh, goodbye. So. Um, look, there's, there's a lot of, of issues and challenges that, that we've got to deal with. Mm -hmm. I would just say, as you've experienced in your family, and for all of us, for the tragedy that we saw with the helicopter crash, killing Kobe Bryant and his daughter the other day, none of us knows how much time we have in our lives. None of us knows how much time we have with those that we care about. and. We've got to live every day like it's our last, treat each other with kindness, express the love that we have for each other uh, so that we have no regrets. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Hi, um, my name is Colby. Um, so Colby, is that your name? Colby. Colby. Oh. So um, my question is, would you try to increase the pay for military personnel? Yes. Um, I serve on the Armed Services Committee in Congress where we deal with things like military pay increases, uh, training, dealing with a lot of the housing problems that military families have, dealing with both readiness and all of the things that allow our men and women in uniform to be best equipped to do their jobs, to keep our country safe, but also making sure that they are able to do so without having to worry about uh, their kids, or their spouses uh, being able to, um, to take care of themselves while they're out on deployments or, or out on missions. I think it's something that um, often goes overlooked, but if you go to a military town, we've got a lot of bases in Hawaii. I've spent a lot of time on military bases across the country. It's really sad that so many of these military bases are surrounded with pawn shops and uh, check cashing um, uh, places where people can go in and try to get their checks cash, get an advance with a very, very, very high interest rate if they don't go and pay that money back right when they get their paychecks. It shows that even our men and women in uniform willing to sacrifice for our countries are having a hard time making ends meet, having a hard time paying their bills. Um, so that's something that, that as president, both for our military and our veterans, I absolutely would address. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thanks. My name's Callie, and is it okay if I share some background history? Of course. So, when I was younger, I was diagnosed with this disorder called PANDAS, which stands for Pediatric Autoimmune Neuropsychiatric Disorder Associated with Streptococcal. And basically, it caused me to like have a bunch of mental issues. Like, I would just be like, amazing little girl and well behaved, you know. <laughs> and then all of a sudden I go into these screaming fits. And I, I've since been cured from it like a while ago. But it's left it still left me with some mental issues. Like I've been diagnosed with anxiety 
and I have some other stuff that I haven't been diagnosed with, but it's still there. So I would like to know what your thoughts are on helping people with mental illness. Did your name Callie, is that what you said? Callie, thank you very much. And thanks for sharing your story, Callie. Um, you are exactly um, illustrating why we need to dedicate resources towards health, including mental health. That a lot of times we talk about health care, but leave out mental health, even though it's just as important as our physical health. I think it's important as we look at dedicating those resources here at school, for example, to make sure that you're able to um, get your uh, concerns addressed, be able to talk to someone who can best help you deal with the challenges that you're struggling with, that we uh, come at this from a holistic perspective. So if you're experiencing anxiety, I think rather than just saying, well, and th I've, I've seen this in the military too, if you're experiencing this or that, we're just gonna give you some pills to try to help numb the problem. But I think we should have professionals who can actually help understand better why you're experiencing that anxiety and to try to help you through, um, through those challenges to be able to alleviate that um, at, at its core, at its root. Thank you. Thank you. How are you doing? My name Hi. is Josh, and I was wondering what would you do to combat the growing gap between the lower, middle, and upper classes in wages? It's a good question. Thank you, Josh. You know, back, I, I mentioned something about a government of, by, and for the powerful elite. When we have a government of, by, and for the powerful elite, instead of a government of, by, and for the people, we see how it's impacting this growing uh, income inequality in our country, where the haves are getting wealthier and the have-nots uh, are struggling more, and this divide is ever increasing. How does this happen? Yes, it has to do with wages and how difficult it is to earn a living wage in this country. It has to do with increasing costs of housing. All the things you get to look forward to after you graduate from high school. Rising costs of health care. Uh, all of these things making it harder and harder just to live and to survive for yourself. What to speak of if you start a family. Uh, while the tax benefits and the policies in our government really uh, disproportionately negatively bene uh, disproportionately benefit those who are earning the most. For example, we saw a big tax bill that was passed, I think it was a couple of years ago now in Congress, that they said would make things better for all Americans, that everyone would end up paying less taxes. Some people did. They got a little reduction in their taxes, which I know made a big impact. And if it's, if it's a, you know, an extra thousand or two thousand dollars at the end of the year that you're able to get back, that, that is a, that's a big deal. However, when you look at the massive tax giveaways, the loopholes, the deductions that were given to uh, the, the like 0.01% of the 1% and to these massive corporations, you see how companies like Amazon get away with paying zero taxes at all while small business owners every day are paying their fair share, paying their taxes, trying to take care of their employees, provide a service to their communities, and not getting any kind of break in the process. So in order to address this, this income inequality and this growing divide, we've got to get to the heart of the pay-to-play culture in Washington that says if you've got the money, you can hire the lobbyists, you get to help write the laws that help benefit yourselves, to the detriment of the rest of the country. We've got to flip the script completely so once again, our policies are being made to serve us, to serve the people of this country. Our government's working for us, not the powerful elite. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hello, Hi. Uh, my name's Griffin, and like, I kind of have like the essential question. Uh, you're stranded on an island, what three, th three things are you bringing with you? <laughs> Ooh. I have a, I have a follow-up. Okay. Is there waves? 
Sure. Or, okay. One of them's a surfboard. Lots of waves. All right. <laughs> one of them's a surfboard. Um, I don't know. Probably one of them would be like the multi-tooled, like ultimate knife. Those things are pretty sweet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't eat meat, but I would use it to be able to, you know, go and harvest my coconuts and and uh, everything else that grows there. That's all it takes. Yeah, exactly. Um, what's the third thing? Um, I, what is it? I know, I'm just thinking out loud, man. Give me a break. <laughs> uh, the third thing that I would bring is, um, no one's ever asked me this question before. I've never actually thought about it. The third thing I would bring is, uh, Something I could make fire with. How about that? Sweet, thank you. <laughs> Essential question. I'm gonna have a better answer next time somebody asks me that. Thank you. Hi, my name is Rosie, and I have a question regarding healthcare and the pharmaceutical business. Yes. Um, so my younger sister has type one diabetes. That means she has to be on insulin shots, um, and she needs insulin to survive. Um, if she doesn't have insulin, she will die. That's just the way it is. Yeah. Um, the cost of an insulin vial ha has gone up to $350 per vial. Um, insulin is critical to her survival and uh, diabetes is a lifelong disease. Yeah. So when she turns 26 and is off my parents' insurance, um, she's on her own. So I'd like to know what you're gonna do about reducing the cost of medication, not just insulin, but all medications and also what you're going to do about healthcare in general, um, but specifically children. Yeah. Thank you. This is a really, really critical question and something that's impacting so many people across the country. We have tens of millions of people who have no insurance whatsoever, still. We have tens of millions more people who have insurance, but they fall into this underinsured category where they've got a fifteen or $20,000 deductible, which means they're not able to get the care they need until they fork out that much of their own money uh, into this health, health care system, uh, both of which leave people completely um, screwed, really, when it comes down to it. Then you have people who have insurance, who may have fantastic and great insurance, but still they're not able to, in that time of need, get the care they need in a way that they can afford it because insurance companies are not in the business of taking care of people. They are in the business of spending the least amount of money possible to carry the greatest profits possible. The same is true of, of big pharma. So we've got to tackle both of these together. So your question is on point. Specifically with big pharma, I'll get out of the way first of all. Campaign finance reform, they all have way too much power and influence over our politicians in Washington because they come and bring their PAC checks, the lobbyists come and deliver these checks, take people to fancy dinners, and buy that influence to make it so that our laws are helping them instead of people like your sister. So that's at the baseline. Number one, we have to make it so that our government has the ability to negotiate lower prescription drug prices uh, with big pharma. Big Pharma's lobbyists have made it so in our laws, even though our government is the largest purchaser of prescription drugs in the world, our laws say that we, our government, cannot negotiate lower prescription drugs prices. It's crazy. I would lift that completely. Work with Congress to lift that prohibition completely. Uh, the second thing is uh, the companies that produce these drugs often abuse our patent laws that say, if you produce this product, you can have it for seven years. When that patent expires, it goes to the market and generic drug companies can produce it at a much cheaper price. So it's cheaper for the consumer. So your family can go and say, all right, I can choose the brand or the generic and pay a whole bunch less. Instead of following the law, they exploit these loopholes where they'll go and, and tweak one minor component of their prescription drug only so they can reset that patent clock and have a monopoly over their product for another seven years, blocking generic drug companies from producing that at a cheaper price. We've got to fix those loopholes and reform our patent system to do that. Third, and these are things that Congress can do right now. 
Uh, we have to allow for the reimportation of cheaper drugs from countries like Canada, where a lot of families are going right now, facing problems just like your sister is potentially facing in the future, going in buying vials and vials of insulin because they're able to get at a fraction of the price that we have to pay right here at home. Uh, those are the first steps that I would take to start to make it so that we have a fair and uh, equitable process towards negotiating lower prescription drug prices. Um, this is directly tied though to the health insurance problem that we face. Uh, I've looked at the, the insurance um, or the health care plans of many other countries and the one I would, I have seen has probably worked best is Australia. My plan here for our country I call a single payer plus plan where every single American is guaranteed quality, affordable health care, while still allowing you, if, if let's say your sister got, her, got a great job and an employer offered a fantastic insurance plan, she obviously would have the choice to benefit from that plan. If she didn't though, if she turns 26 and she's still looking for a job or the job she has does not offer insurance whatsoever, she can have the peace of mind along with every American that you will get the quality health care that you need and deserve whenever you need it, regardless of how much or how little you pay. By doing this, we as a country can bring down the overall cost of what we are currently paying into health care now. We are paying far more than any other country in the world for health care, yet we see far worse outcomes and we see people struggling just like your sister. By doing this, we take away the big profits that big insurance is making off of taxpayers and really just focus on the delivery of health care. Last thing I'll say on this is so much of this is focused on big insurance and big pharma. And a lot of times focusing on true health care is lost in the process. I think we've got to invest more in uh, prevention and wellness and nutrition to be able to promote a healthier society uh, in this country which will also not only lead to people who are uh, less sick people, uh, but it will also lead to a further reduction in how much we as a country are spending on healthcare. Thank you. Yes, sir, bring it home. Uh, I was curious what your policies or uh, what you thought about uh, the ongoing trade war with China. What's your name? Uh, Khan Simeone. What is it? Khan. Khan. Thank you very much, Khan. Uh, the ongoing trade war with China is something that, um, while I agree that there are, uh, there's a trade imbalance that we need to address with China, uh, the way that this administration is doing it I think has been pretty irresponsible in creating a lot of uncertainty in the marketplace, creating a lot of hardship for farmers, manufacturers, small business owners, people here in the United States of America in a very, uh, taking a very volatile kind of shoot from the hip approach to resolving these issues. Uh, it's had a very big negative impact, uh, even on small business owners here in New Hampshire who I've met who don't sell anything to China, they don't buy anything directly from China, but they buy, thing from, buy things from companies who do. And so you're seeing that trickle effect where you've got a tariff war going on. China's not paying for those increased tariffs. They're passing those prices on to those who are buying their products directly and indirectly here at home. Uh, the the uh, challenge that is posed by this increasing trade and tariff war that never gets talked about is the realities of the danger when you're waging an economic war with another country, especially another country that is a nuclear armed country, a, an economic war if allowed to continue, can very quickly turn to a hot war, something that is not in any of our interests, which is why diplomacy is so important. Thank you. Awesome, thank you guys so much. I appreciate having the opportunity to be here and join you. I'm going for the Chiefs. Yeah, I don't know if they'll win. Here's why, you may, you may not cheer for me as loud, here's why I'm going for the Chiefs. None of my teams actually made it to the Super Bowl, but uh, the very first NFL football game I ever attended was right before I deployed to the Middle East. We happened to be near Kansas City, so we went to see a game, and so I bow my hat to the Kansas City Chiefs for that reason. 
<laughs> Thank you guys so much. Guys, you can be dismissed. Thanks. <laughs>